Well, the New York Times has recently sued OpenAI and Microsoft over the use of its content to train generative, generative artificial intelligence and large language model systems, a move that could see the company receive billions of dollars in damages. Joining me live to discuss this and more is Dr Mike Seymour, the Sydney University lecturer in digital innovation and an expert on artificial intelligence and machine learning technology. Mike, thanks so much for your time this morning. Just how significant is this move by the New York Times? It's pretty significant, uh, though it's an incredibly complex problem because um, it kind of really hits at the heart of what we think these things are versus what they sort of actually are in terms of, I guess, both perception and use. And is this likely to set a bit of a standard going forward depending on what the outcome is? Yeah, I mean... As I just alluded to, there's this whole notion that when you're using a search engine, it's sort of throwing up facts. The thing about these generative AI programs like ChatGPT is that they're not actually meant to be throwing up facts. They're meant to be, in terms of the way they're built, just producing a plausible result. So the problem becomes if you start asking them for facts and it's just giving you a guess of what a fact might look like, um, is that in violation of copyright is that misrepresentation like it's quite a complex problem um they don't they weren't sort of designed to be fact engines but we're looking at them and acting as if they are sources of facts which is why the new york times is so upset because in the case for example they offered up an example where somebody asked for what the new york times would say about healthy foods and it gave a plausible answer of what an article in the new york times might say which of course wasn't what the New York Times had said. So the New York Times is most uh, naturally upset about that, but that's kind of the nature of the beast. It is. Uh, will companies like ChatGPT simply need to find a way to work with writers and publishers in order to successfully continue into the future? You're absolutely right. That's one of the key areas. For example, when we come to imagery, like uh, producing a, a picture, uh, some of the companies, such as Adobe, have gone to great lengths to produce sort of cordoned off areas of training data, in other words, the input to these things, that are fully uh, cleared for such use. But the large language models don't work like that. They have such enormous amounts of input that they're just basically taking a look at what's on the internet. And central to this case is whether or not interpreting and learning from what's on the internet is the same as copying what's on the internet and then violating copyright. And so it's a, it's a very complex problem. It's one that has major ramifications because of course this stuff is so powerful and so innovative that many of people would be upset to see it shut down. Well, of course, others would hate to see great publications such as the New York Times in any way kind of failing because of these innovations. Yeah, it is a, a bit of a tough one. Now, um, AI was really front and centre in 2023. What are your predictions and what do you think we can expect to see from AI in 2024? Well, if we thought it was big in 23, it's going to get bigger in 24. Um, at the moment, what we've got is really great ability to produce text and really great ability to produce kind of still images. But even more than that, we're going to see it producing moving video footage. So we're just seeing the start of that now. And so instead of just typing in that I'd like to see uh, an image of what a professor at Sydney University looks like, you could actually ask it to produce a video of a lecture giving a talk about something at Sydney University. We're not quite there yet, but that's pretty much uh, on the horizon and it's a huge arms race to produce these engines that will generatively produce full videos. And as AI is further woven into the fabric of our lives, are we likely to see more calls for transparency and responsible development uh, throughout the next year? Yeah, I think there are so many ethical issues on this. Certainly Sydney University does a lot of work in this area because it really impacts almost every aspect of the kind of modern technical world that we live in because it's going to both change jobs that people have, affect how the data that you and I generate is used, and also just what's possible for our society to produce and be able to kind of leverage off in terms of a productivity tool. So uh, it's a hugely significant area. Do you see uh, the future of AI being a positive uh, in, in our society? 
Yeah, I get asked this a lot, and I guess the best way to describe this, um, and I didn't invent this, but I think it's a great way of thinking about it, is a lot of this technology is like steel. You can use this steel to make ambulances and you can use this steel to make tanks. Now, if we're a society that manages to produce lots of ambulances and help people, that's great. But if you ignore the fact that some people could use this for sort of harmful things, then you're being naive. So some people will use AI technology in negative ways, but I honestly believe there are far more advantages to doing this if we can fine tune our regulatory and uh, sort of procedural models to deal with this. And so, of course, that's one of our roles to try and give a kind of a guide to those policymakers, given how quickly this is moving. And I've never seen anything move as fast as this AI revolution. Yeah, it really has uh, come a long way. And uh, are people just going to have to jump on board and, and embrace it now? Because it's really not going anywhere, is it? Yeah, it's certainly not going anywhere. Um, I guess I get asked a lot if people's jobs are going to be replaced. And generally speaking, when we get these waves of technology, there's a displacement, but not a replacement. So we've had personal computers now for like, what, 40 years or something, and we haven't suddenly got mass unemployment. So I don't see that that somebody can expect to be, you know, thrown out of their job overnight because of all of this stuff. But I do expect that if you are working currently and employed in various capacities, you'll have more chance of promotion and more chance of better job opportunities if you can embrace this technology. And I'd say that works for the society as a whole as well. If a society can adopt these technologies in sort of sensible ways, we could see huge productivity gains. But if we turn a blind eye to them, clearly other people will run rings around us uh, in terms of being able to produce and address many of the issues that these things are, are well designed to uh, facilitate. Dr. Mike Seymour, thank you so much for your time and for your insights this morning. Have a wonderful new year. Same to you.